Oh, all right. So group one, we asked uh, each other a few questions, like all the questions that we were supposed to answer. Um, came up with why do certain chemicals or elements react the way they do? Like if you put magnesium in water, why does it react? I'm curious. I don't know why. Uh, we all want to have a general understanding of all chemistry. Like we just kind of want to understand the class well, come out of it with knowledge that we didn't have beforehand. Gee, so uh, you just you just want to understand all of chemistry in in in, in, a, in a single class. So exactly. that's like, we, we should be able to handle that. Yeah, that, that's not a problem. We're aiming for the stars. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll definitely have you understanding every bit of chemistry at, at the end of the term. So no worries there. All right. And we want to see how liquid and gas formation works. We want to know how to make drugs like Breaking Bad. Uh, <laughs> and what is the chemical reaction in a battery? Well, you know, as long as long as you didn't do a lousy job like Jesse and did a better, better job afterwards, like 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 the doc, that's 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 what we need. You know, I, 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 I would I would be ashamed if there was like some really crappy meth going around that would like link to any any of my students. I'd be very upset. Only high quality. And the chemical reaction of battery. That's interesting um, because the new battery that Tesla will be using was actually developed by someone in the chemistry department of my old university in Canada. And I'm expecting that person's going to be fairly wealthy soon. Uh, <laughs> supposedly it's the, this new battery is going to have like a thousand mile range and something like a one to 2 million miles before you need to replace them. So Whoa. that would be pretty cool if, the, if that, if that works out. So, you know, figures crossed on that one. And as far as liquid solids and gas will definitely, I'm glad you put, added plasma in there. Most people don't include, anyone tell me what a plasma is? Anyone know what a plasma is? No. Basically, it's a gas made up of charged particles. So um, like a you know, neon sign that's glow when you put, um, um, so it's a gas in there, but then when you put electricity through it, you, you, you turn that, uh, those gas molecules into ions. And so you've got ions in, in the gas, that's a plasma. So yeah, that's, most people forget that that's one of the four uh, basic states of matter, but we'll definitely be learning about solids, liquids, and gases this term. Plasma is a little beyond us, but we can certainly look into it. So, cool. What about number two? Who's, who's presenting for number two? Oh, it's got a bunny, a puppy, and a kitty. I love it. Oh, I am Allie. Um, so at first we didn't really know what we were doing. So we drew a bunch of like animals. So we started with the dog and then the cat. No, that's awesome. <laughs> and then, um, then we actually started doing our work and we, um, each attributed a question. So we asked like, what role does chemistry play in manufactured materials? And then, um, I asked how chemistry play, play a part in food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then, that's a lot of that's that's something that are you interested in like molecular gastronomy that 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 sort of thing? Yeah. Well, personally, I'm gonna major in nutrition. So oh, I perfect. Can a little bit more that's about that. Perfect. Um, a lot of people in our group um is gonna major in engineering, I think. So, um, yeah. Uh, another person asked chemistry just in everyday life and then chemistry in medicine and BME and then someone asked that, look, that looks that looks like my doggy I was giving them some some medicine this morning squirting it in his mouth okay. he wasn't terribly happy about it but yeah it doesn't look like he's enjoying it <laughs> um, chemistry has an important pull important role in um, pet medicine mm -hmm. and then used in creation of drugs and and yeah, that's our... Yeah, slide. I mean, we find out when you look at the, the medicines we give our pets, they're all a lot different than the medicine we take ourselves. Even though, even though it may be the same medicine, the doses 
and the body's response to them are completely different. So like, you know, even like a little dog could take a, a dose of something, you know, like a painkiller that would, that would put you out for days um, because their metabolism is much faster than yours. So yeah, basically what I'm saying is don't take your dog's pills. <laughs> they would probably kill you. <laughs> But that's part of like the interesting chemistry uh, involved in that because they can break them down so much faster than you can. So that's cool, especially in everyday life. What I, I de when I'm teaching, I definitely try and put that in as much as I can, because well, it's even like the last last group said, you know, what happens when you throw magnesium into water? The answer is nothing. But if you throw sodium into water, it explodes. Well, you know, why is that? And that's one of the first things uh, we're going to learn. You learn that pretty pretty early on. So you want to yeah you want to make it as relatable to every day as you can. So that great job. That's really 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 awesome. So group three, who wants to do the? Uh, I will be awesome. Uh, sharing this. Okay. My name is Gage. Hey um, Gage. Hello. And it's funny you guys are talking about a dog. I have a little puppy, but she's too crazy to have it in my room right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I've got two of them here, and the little one like sitting on my lap while I while I give class. But you know, yeah. So, um, well, of course, we first had to add explosions. You know, gotta have explosions. Gotta have explosions. That's the best thing to learn about. Um, and then, definitely right off of that, like you know, there's other things in explosions. So we added the uh, chemical reactions part because. You know, having any... Well, actually, of only one of those two pictures you showed is an explosion. Which one is it? Um, I'm guessing the top left one. Mm -hmm. Why isn't the one on the right an explosion? Because uh, it's, it's more of a... Um, it's not an explosion. It's kind of just letting off heat. So it's a... Uh, oh, I forgot. <laughs> that's, it. That's, just, that's just burning. Yeah. That's just that's just a, a um, combust yeah, that's just a combustion one. reaction. Yeah, so, combustion. So that's what it was. How do you go from a combustion reaction to an explosion? Because basically, explosion is a combustion reaction. But what do you need for it to be an explosion? Um, definitely, there's probably definitely some sort of um, more, I guess, like of a, I don't know, a higher potential in it than just combustion. There's that. And pressure. pressure that's, okay. that's the other thing you need. Yeah. So yeah, um, if you, so yeah, actually there's some really, really, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. Um, there's some really cool chemistry involved with explosions as you could, po as you could probably imagine. Um, but one of the things I will, I will say, like look at, uh, we'll talk about um, nitrogen. Nitrogen being one of the more interesting uh, elements. But yeah, uh, nitrogen compounds are extremely important for explosions, and you don't really see explosions without nitrogen. So we'll we'll, we'll talk about that later. Okay, and then of course, like Group One, we had to add Breaking Bad. Got to get that ninety nine percent in there. Yep, yep. If I find any, if I find any ex students making really crappy meth, I'm going to be <laughs> very sad. Mm -hmm. It's got to be the good stuff. And I just can't. And I'm not going to spoil it. But and anyways. thermo, yeah, <laughs> thermo is basically that will be the last uh, chapter if we get to it. And yeah, thermochemistry is really interesting, um, I find. So, because yeah, that, that's basically where your explosions and all that are coming from. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the last thing is just, um, I don't know, it's a picture of somebody, um, I guess, adding some sort of. Uh, solution so a pipe someone pipe yeah, pipetting yep some sort of solution into a glass beaker or whatever so some is someone actually or thinking about working in a lab jasmine are you thinking about working in a lab um i don't think so i oh, see you're down as, as public health here yeah but not 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 that kind no <laughs> <laughs> fair enough all right let's go to group four Great job, group three, group Thank four. You. Oh, pretty, awesome. So who's, who's doing, the, doing the presentation? Uh, and, oh, sorry, is your brother here? 
He's downstairs, I think. Sorry. Oh, so my car's here. Uh, yeah, I can present. Is uh, someone bothering you, Francesca? <laughs> my cousin. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, Get him the hell out of there. Yeah, uh, so my name is Francesca. Um, some questions that we had that we're interested in learning throughout this um, semester is um, what the scientific method is, since we'll be going that like probably like the first few couple doing days. That, doing that in about 10 minutes, so yeah. yeah. Um, how chemistry relates to the human body, how it affects us overall. Um, some of us were interested in the periodic table, all the different um, elements that we can find, you know, ev everywhere, really. <laughs> so what is it about the periodic table that people find interesting? I was, I'm always fascinated by that. Because I've been studying chemistry for, you know, 40 years now. And I, yeah, I, I endlessly find the periodic table fascinating. So what is it that you're interested in? in it? Hey. Like me personally? Well, just who, who, and who in the group came up with it and what, what is it they were interested in? Hey. I'm not too sure which one of us in our group was interested in it. Because it's a fact, it's just the, I'm interested in like the history of science and the history of the periodic table is really interesting. But you, you won't believe me, but believe, one, of, one of like the biggest, biggest Mac daddies of all time uh, came up with the periodic table. So yeah, we'll, 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 we'll learn about him a little bit later, but, uh, but yeah, it's very, very interesting uh, history. Um, and then other things um, are just doing like labs in general, like a lot of hands off um, experiments, um, chemical reactions. Um, another one is food chemistry, how different foods affect the human body and how it can affect you know, even our animals too. And um, like going off into space, like how that is even like possible with things that we have now. <laughs> Well, you need you need a chemical reaction to get you there, right? So, actually, one of one of the reactions we're gonna uh, learn about in one of the recitations is like the original rocket fuel, um, hydrazine. So we'll 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 learn about that about that sort of stuff. So that's cool, excellent. Let's go to group five. Thanks, Francesca. So who's presenting for group five? Uh, me. Name's Andre. Hey, Andre. Hey, um, so um, we started talking to each other which topic of chemistry we're excited to learn about. So um, first thing was Adrian. Um, so is, is, is excited a strong word to use? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Um, All right, no problem. Oh, pH. Talks, um, pH is definitely interesting. Yeah, well, um, hopefully we'll, uh, we will yeah. get to acids and bases. But even if we don't get to talk about them in... Uh, specifically, we'll, gen we'll definitely talk about what pH means. Does anyone know what pH means? Acid levels. Or hydrogen. I think it's like a measure how acidic a water is. Or, or hydrogen. That's right. But what, what, what is it? Uh, what does that Power number mean? Hydrogen. pH scale? Yes, yeah, it's, it's right. It's the concentration of hydrogen ion yeah. in, in water. Mm-hmm. Cool. Oh, yeah. So what else, what else do we have here? Oh, um, yeah, next for Angela, um, she told that she's excited to learn about stoichiometry. Oh my God, we're going to be doing so much stoichiometry, you're going to be just, the, the name will give you chills. Yeah, and we gave, we gave the definition of it, which is the calculation of reactants and products and chemical reactions. Yep. Um, next thing was for Juliana, the food chemistry, she likes to talk about with that. And then, um, for me, it's going to be um, the phases and classification of matter, the solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. Yeah. Oh, cool. You have the second group that's remembered to put plasma in there. That's yeah. Ex that's excellent. Because, <laughs> yeah, we don't talk about plasma much, but, you know, mm. it's, yes, yeah. it's kind of important. If it wasn't for plasma, we wouldn't have the sun. So, that, so there you go. All right. Thanks, Andre. I appreciate it. Thank Let's you. Let's go to group six. Lots of beakers. Lots of beakers. So who's pre who's presenting for group six? Uh, um, Edith. Edith? Um, yes. Okay, cool. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Edith. The reason why, uh, uh, well, uh, today's presentation, I'm with my team. Uh, we were talking why the, the reason why they're interested in chemistry. 
Amarani said uh, that she was interested because she wants to figure out some formulas, which is uh, or is defined by consistent elements. Uh, that, but that, is, that is something that is definitely something we're going to be doing. You're going to learn about how the original chemical formulas are actually, how do we come up with them? Because when you think about it, you've got this, you know, substance, how the hell are you going to find out what the chemical formula for it is? And that's one of the things you're going to learn how to do. So that's, that's excellent. And uh, my other team uh, made uh, was uh, Chris Pistel. I'm sorry if I uh, mispronounce it. And she's interesting because she wants uh, to experiment chemical reactions. She's interested on that one. Yeah, we'll be and, doing that. And Kyle would love uh, to be learning different applications um, for chem. And Chris, and, uh, it's because of its chemical boundings, um, which is uh, the, uh, well, I look it up and it says uh, it's a strong force of attractions holding atoms in together in a molecule. Yeah, we're going to learn there's a whole bunch of different kinds of chemical bonds. Many different kinds. But the important thing to remember is that pretty much all of them involve electrons. Because really, um, sort of something I like to say at the beginning, at the beginning of chemistry class, basically it's the study of electrons, really. Um, everything is electrons in, in, in chemistry. They influence everything. And so you don't have any chemical bonds without the involving electrons. You don't get interactions between molecules without electrons. It's all about electrons. So if you don't remember anything else about chemistry, you'll remember it's, it, it, it basically should be called electronics. So yeah, we'll, we'll be spending a lot of time. I think there's a whole chapter devoted to chemical bonding. So no, no problems there. And yeah, that's pretty much it. And just myself, uh, I'm interested because I want to go uh, into medical field. And okay. Apparently, uh, I was, I'm still debating which side I want to go, but uh, hopefully I'll do surgery. That will help me a lot, but uh, we will see. You better know some chemistry if you're doing surgery. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or you better hope your anesthesiologist does <laughs> because someone's <laughs> going to be in trouble if they don't. And actually, one, one of the things we will learn um, in class is the different ways to calculate um, concentrations. And one of the ways of calculating concentrations is used specifically in the medical field. And so, like, you know, um, when you talk about um, the IV solutions and saline and that, that sort of thing, they, they use a very specific kind of concentration that's only really used in, in the medical field. And you'll learn, you'll learn how to do that. So hopefully that, that will be of use to you. All right. Thanks, Edith. Let's go to group seven. Ooh, pretty. All right. I'll present. Uh, my name is Justin Anderson, and we just took a couple of uh, brainstorming ideas about things that we wanted to learn this semester. Um, I started things off with the scientific method. Uh, what better time in the age of science denialism to learn out methods to figure out the truth, like the scientific mm -hmm. method. Uh, biochemistry, enzymatic well, truth, reactions. That, 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 that's a rather loaded concept there, Justin. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the truth as far as science can tell yeah. us. Then biochemistry with enzymatic reactions leading into kind of pharmacology and how drugs are uh, interacting with the human body. Our group member, Hannah, is a medic and she's interested in that kind of thing. Cool. Uh, naturally. Uh, also nuclear chemistry, uh, chemistry on the atomic scale, and uh, toxicology, a lot going on with the whole pre-med kind of milieu. Man, sounds like you got a, a lot of bio, uh, potential biochemists in, in, in that group. I'll have a lot of fun with you guys. Seems like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, we, will, we will be learning uh, some uh, certain things that are very important uh, to biochemistry, uh, particularly um, intermolecular interactions like why certain things are hydrophilic, they like to be in, 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 in a water environment, why certain things are hydrophobic and they don't. And it seems like that should be fairly simple. It's an extremely complicated um, thing to understand. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about that when we get to, but everything else, I, I try and relate everything in chemistry to, to biochemistry as, as much as I can. A lot of the reactions are gonna be learning about or reactions that happen that's going on inside your body like right now. So yeah, I look forward, I look forward to getting a lot of good questions from, from everyone in this group. All right, 
Thanks, Justin. Who's, I'm gonna, uh, group eight. Who's presenting for group eight? I will be presenting. Hey, Ken. So, hello. So the, the first one is chemistry experience. Well, I hope you don't do experiments like that, Amber. I think there's a lot of problems there that I see. <laughs> well, at least she's wearing eye protection. That's about the only good thing I can I can say about that. Right. So, yeah. Some of us are looking forward to experiments that, such as some that we have done in high school, such as the fire. The um, yeah. So, the second one is amino acids. That's what. Caitlin put that's the building blocks of life kind of and how it that's, can it's one of the, the building blocks of life sure so right so how it can relate to the human body and that's what we find interesting so the third one is labs ex and experiments with chemical reactions so I find it interesting because it's more hands-on and it's something that we can do and that I find interesting. Yeah, that's that's something I think it's going to be much better than than lab. The, 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 the 210 I taught last term, we did everything virtually. So even our experiments were done online. And it's like, yeah, you learn a little something. But yeah, unless people learn by doing things, you know, with, with, with their hands, at least I do. You see, it's, I think you retain it longer if you actually do it yourself. So yeah, I, that, that's, that's, that's an excellent suggestion. So the fourth one is, is Chris, the line, the line, the picture right there is, so how chemistry relates to the wildlife and that is something that he is into. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine that chemistry can relate to the species of animals and nature. So the periodic table, um, right. So the periodic table is interesting because it's a lot of elements and yeah. Yeah, we're never gonna stop talking about the periodic table. Hopefully everyone has a periodic table right now. Um, you don't have to like buy one or anything. Just just get one, um, just print one off 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 the internet and just have it have it nearby. You, you can see I've I've got my periodic table right here, um, because eighty percent of what you need to know about chemistry is right there. That's really all you need, and and we'll explain why that is. But there's a lot more to the periodic table than you think. So that's what's one of the very first things right, we're so learning about is the periodic table. In that and how it relates to the elements, like how they relate and the deeper things into it. So the 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 sixth one is see the the chemical. Uh, I mean the the medicine, the symbol. Mm -hmm. So for me, I want to work in the medical field, and I I I would imagine that chemistry would play a part in that. Such you as, think? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's so, very important. So earlier you, you spoke about uh, anesthesia and how mm -hmm. it relates. So it would be interesting. And oh labs yeah, yeah. And I mean, clinical labs and right. And Amber said nursing, right next to the right. And that's about it. Yeah, I, I spent ten years in in the medical school at UCLA. So um, yeah, there's a believe me, there's a definite link between medicine and and chemistry. You can't. You can't have one without the other. Um, thank you very much. So we just have a bunch of blank slides after that. Okay. So great job, everybody. Really, I think you, you put a lot of a lot of work into making those. Um, what I'm going to do now is go back to my slides here. My slides. So what I want to do is just basically introduce the this, this scientific method portion. So hopefully every, everyone, can, everyone can see the screen. Yes. All yeah. right, cool. So excellent that a lot of people uh, were interested in, in learning about this because basically that's what we're going to be talking about. So generally, 
this is sort of an outline of what we think about when we think about uh, scientific method. And uh, as was pointed out, there's a lot of confusion about uh, science these days, much to my chagrin. But um, it basically just starts with curiosity. I mean, it sounds kind of corny and cheesy, but that's how everything starts, right? Um, everything is happening around us. Someone gets interested in one particular thing and they start to observe that one particular thing. That's how everything starts. And so what is a hypothesis? Could someone tell me what, the hypo what a hypothesis is? You form a hypothesis. What does that mean? An educational guess? Yeah, more or less. An educated guess to what, though? Um, it's a limited What's evidence. So it's a guess that what? What, what are you guessing? A guess what that has... You would have? Sorry, what was, what was that? Question? So what, oh, excuse me. No. Sorry, my, my big girl is chewing on something she shouldn't be chewing on. So, so my hypothesis, um, it's, it's, it's an educated guess, but what is it an educated guess concerning? Like if you had, if you had to go into a little more detail, what would you say? It's an educated guess about what? A possible explanation to perhaps provide evidence of something? So it's an explanation of something. Basically sort of what I'm getting at is that usually when you have a, I mean, you're all right, but sort of what I was, when I think about, in the way I think about of the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Generally, when you do an experiment, you vary one thing and you see what effect it has on another thing. So what you're basically, you're sort of trying to make a cause and effect argument. In general, that's, that's, that's what you're doing. Um, so you have a hypothesis that if I change X, Y happens. And so that Y is dependent on X. That's sort of the hypothesis you're making. So you make a prediction that if I change X, Y will happen. And so you do an experiment and either it's consistent with like when X changes, Y changes, or it isn't. It, you know, maybe you change X by two, by a factor of two, and Y goes up by a factor of two one day. The next day it goes down by a factor of two. The next day it doesn't change at all. Well, then you probably need a new hypothesis. So you basically you keep tweaking um, your hypothesis until your results are then either consistent with that, with that prediction. Where's my little pointer here? So basically you find out your results are consistent with your hypothesis and that contributes to the growing body of knowledge. And that's like, as a scientist, that's what I kind of like to do is <laughs> contribute to the body of knowledge or you do more testing and it doesn't support. Like I said, you know, one day you get one result, the next day you get another one, a week later you get a different one. Well, A, either you're doing your experiments wrong or your hypothesis is wrong. So the first thing you would do is test your, is my experimental design any good? That'd be the first thing. Maybe I need to change my experimental design. It could be that when I'm changing, I think I'm changing one thing, but I'm actually changing two or three things without knowing it. Um, for instance, I might think my reaction, uh, the rate of my reaction is dependent on the temperature. That's a pretty good hypothesis. But what if you change the pH at the same time? What if the pH is different each time? Well, that's going to affect your reaction rate too. So you got to make sure that you're changing only one thing. So once you've got your reaction uh, set up properly and it still doesn't go with your, with your hypothesis, then you change your hypothesis. So once you've done your contribution to your body of knowledge, basically this is where 
you would, if you like scientists like I was, you would write a paper. You would publish a paper in a, in a, in a scientific journal. You say, I, this is my hypothesis. These are the results that support my hypothesis. And this are the, these are the conclusions. You're going to be writing reports just like that yourself in, in class. You're going to have a, 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 have a hypothesis before you do the experiment. You're going to run the experiment. You're going to test your hypothesis, see whether it agrees or it doesn't agree. And then you're going to write your conclusions. So after other scientists then read your paper and they agree, they see the same thing. So they basically, when someone repeats your experiments or even tries a different version of your experiment and they get the same thing, that observation then becomes a law. Like the, well, what was the law of gravity until recently? Now, what do you think the difference is between a law and a theory? Probably the law is something that it's, uh... Uh, yeah, uh, because, um, like uh, something that uh, it's uh, how to explain it. Like it has to stick like that. Uh, it needs a proof, something like that. You know, it cannot. You know, in the theory, it's just something that could have happened, but it's not. You cannot proceed with that. I don't know if I'm explaining myself right. I'm sorry. It's trick. It's a. It's a very misunderstood thing, actually. A law, a law, and a theory. That's, that's one of the things that, that people who, who don't believe in evolution are constantly throwing in our faces. It's like, oh, it's just a theory. What they don't understand is a theory is better than a law. The difference between a law and a theory is that I have an observation and I say that temperature changes the rate of reaction. Uh, if, if, if my if the temperature goes up, my rate of reaction goes up by a factor of blah, blah, blah. And everyone sees that over and over around the world. Okay, that's a law. Do you know why it does that? That's the difference. So a law, like I said recently, there was always um, the law of gravity. Everyone's heard of Newton's law of gravity. But Newton didn't know why gravity worked. Newton could explain to you how gravity is involved in Jupiter orbiting uh, the sun, and he could use all these formulas to tell you that Jupiter will be in a particular place at a particular time, and he was right, but he could not explain to you how it worked. It was only till about five years ago when we discovered gravitational waves that we went from the law of gravity to the theory of gravity, because now we know how it works. So that was something that, that even Einstein didn't know. So it was the law of gravity, now it's the theory of, of gravity. So remember that theory is better than a law. That sounds weird, <laughs> because when we think of the law, I think, well, there's nothing above the law. You got the Supreme Court, that's the law, and that's it. Um, but remember, theory comes with not only knowing that X changes Y, but why, why that happens. So a theory basically explains a law. So that's, that's something for everyone to, to, to remember. Is that, is that clear to everybody? Yes, Cause yes, it's a, yes, it's a really important concept yes. that will come up over and over and over. People will throw that near, well, it's just a theory. Well, it's better than a law. <laughs> it's something that, yeah, it's, I, I find that even scientists have a hard time remembering that. So hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll remember that. So here is the video. Basically, it's about the scientific process itself. It's a really interesting story about a couple of scientists from Australia um, who discovered something really important and nobody believed them for a really long time. And this happens all the time. Um, this happens more frequently than you might believe because when you think about it, um, we were talking earlier about what's the truth, the scientific truth. We want to find the truth. Well, if you think that science is the truth, if someone comes along and says what you think is not true, you're generally going to reject them, even if they're right. So you have to remember that the truth in, in sort of scientific terms is not what it really means to the lay person, because 
we're never going to stop asking questions. There are certain things that you know we that we you know believe fully and 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 experiments over and over and over again prove it, but we're never satisfied that that's the final answer on that. So we're constantly asking new questions, and this is a classic example of that. So hopefully, can everyone see it? Yes. Okay. Um, oh, this thing? Was, yeah, all the We're not getting here. the sound? Okay. Um, hmm. I hosted a big party over the summer on Zoom. Uh, if you go into your Zoom settings, you'll find under audio, there will be a checkbox to mark that says share audio when screen sharing. Ah, there we go. Okay. That's the one you want. Um, oh, under screen sharing? Could be. I found it under the settings, just general settings under audio, but it could also be in your screen sharing settings. Where are my, where do I find my settings? Oh, share computer sound. How about that's it? Okay. Colorado's role in Elsie's here now. Barry Marsh and Robin Warren were awarded the 2005 yes, Nobel Prize in Medicine right, cool. for their groundbreaking discovery. So I'll just, I'll just go papers. back a little bit. So the community had widely accepted the theory that excess stomach acid was a root cause of peptic ulcer disease. This famous no acid, no ulcer dogma was based on decades of rigorous scientific study and supported by sound experimental evidence that acid reducing drugs cured the painful symptoms of ulcers. In this video, we'll see how the subsequent discovery of a gastric bacterium, Helicobacter pylori, or H. pylori for short, transformed our understanding of peptic ulcer disease. The two Australian physicians who elucidated H. pylori's role in ulcer disease, Barry Marshall and Robin Warren, were awarded the 2005 Nobel Prize in Medicine for their groundbreaking discovery. This video is part of the problem solving video series. Problem solving skills in combination with an understanding of the natural and human made world are critical to the design and optimization of systems and processes. Hi. My name is Adrian Lee and I'm an Emeritus Professor of Medical Microbiology at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. I've worked on spiral shaped bacteria in the intestines since 1968 and so worked in parallel with Marshall and Warren over the course of their discovery. One of the greatest moments of my life was when they invited me and my wife to the Nobel Prize Award Ceremony in Stockholm, Sweden. Thus I know their story very well and consider it to be a wonderful summary of science in action. Before watching this video, you should be familiar with the scientific method and its central role in the investigation of scientific phenomena. By the end of this video, you will be able to 1. Describe the general steps of the scientific method. 2. Recognize the complex and multifaceted nature of the scientific process. And 3. Explain how the discovery of H. pylori and its connection to peptic ulcer disease exemplifies key aspects of the scientific process. Before going into Warren Marshall's story, I first have a question for you. What do you think are some of the steps involved in the process of scientific investigation? Okay, so what do we think? What are, the, what are some of the key things if you're doing a scientific investigation? What, do you, what are the steps you have to take? Have a hypothesis. Got to have a hypothesis. Excellent. Yep. You got to start with that. Or observe. Yeah. You got to observe something. Even before you get to a hypothesis, you have to carefully 
observe something, um, well, A, you got to be interested in it, you know, obviously. And then, yeah, pay careful attention. Be really, any, any other steps you want to think about? You should ask questions. Who are you going to ask these questions to? Yourself or whoever's involved. Yeah, you would ask questions. What kind of questions do you think? Um, Does X affect Y? Sorry? Does X affect Y? Yeah, like, why is this happening? Um, how is it we're going to show what's happening? Yeah, that's, that's, that's why scientists always meet in groups. You very rarely see one person working by themselves making, um, I mean, it's not unheard of, but generally you go in groups because it's really important to get different opinions on like what's the best way to proceed. So anybody else have any? Hypothesis. What's that? Um, testing it, like doing the hypothesis you got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and yeah, obviously testing. All right, let's see. Oh, so if people have to leave, yeah. um, that's fine. I will put, there'll be a link to uh, uh, the video in uh, Canvas. You can ask, you can answer the questions uh, later, okay? So if you, if you have to go by three, that's, that's, no, that's, that's no problem. Some of you might have said, conduct experiments make observations, analyze data, disseminate results, or something similar. These are all key elements of the scientific method. The scientific method provides us with an objective and systematic way to focus our inquiry and organize our curiosity. As shown here, the scientific method is often presented linearly. But really, the scientific method is highly iterative and non-linear, most scientists do not follow a rigid checklist. There isn't one standard way to do science. Science is a dynamic process, not a fixed methodology. Let's return to Marshall and Warren and the events that led to their Nobel Prize winning discovery. See if you can identify the various elements of the scientific method. Our story begins with Robin Warren, a histopathologist at the Royal Perth Hospital in Western Australia. In 1979, Warren noticed a thin dark line in specimens from his gastric biopsy patients. He switched the microscope to a higher magnification and observed what looked like spiral-shaped bacteria. He noticed the bacteria almost always associated with evidence of gastritis or inflammation of the stomach. Warren was convinced that the bacteria were important, but at the time, doctors believed that no bacteria could survive in the acid stomach and thus showed little interest in his work. Two years later, Barry Marshall, then a young clinical trainee in the same hospital, joined Warren in his study of gastric bacteria. Warren convinced Marshall that the spiral bacteria were significant and not just contamination from the laboratory. To further study the bacteria, they would first need to grow up cultures in the lab. This proved to be frustratingly difficult. Marshall tried culturing spiral bacteria from 30 different patients. The result was always the same, blank Petri dishes. Then, in April 1982, Warren and Marshall left for the Easter holiday. And when they returned from the five-day break, they were surprised to find thriving bacterial growth. The problem hadn't been the culture process. The bacteria were simply slow growers. And after more than a year, Marshall and Warren finally had their bacterium. Microbiologist at the Royal Perth Hospital started identification tests and found the bacterium to be of a completely new genus. It was eventually named Helicobacter pylori or H. pylori. As they were trying to grow the bacterium in the lab, Marshall and Warren were also trying to determine the medical role of their bacterium. They examined gastric samples from 100 patients where, to their surprise, H. pylori were found in more than half the specimens. The bacterium was almost always present in patients with gastritis and peptic ulcers. So Warren and Marshall began to suspect that gastric diseases were in fact caused by H. pylori and eagerly presented their findings to the medical community. Much to their disappointment, their bacterial theory was widely rejected and ridiculed. 
It was an uphill battle trying to publish their results in medical journals. Instead of backing down, Marshall and Warren sought other opportunities to spread the word. They presented their results at the European Campylobacter meeting in Brussels in September 1983. I was in the audience that day and can still recall the excitement of hearing about this new bacterium. At around the same time, an English microbiologist, Martin Skiro, successfully cultured H. pylori from biopsy specimens in his own laboratory. He convinced the influential medical journal, The Lancet, to publish Warren and Marshall's definitive paper in 1984. Again, their radical hypothesis was harshly condemned. Some criticised their lack of experimental controls, others dismissed their idea as offensive. To move forward, Warren and Marshall would need more experimental proof that H. So a little pause there. What do you think he means by experimental controls? What is, what is he talking about? Something that is non-changing. So what, what isn't changing? Um, maybe like they're, uh, the way they apply the research, I mean the study or test, I guess. Yeah, basically, yeah, like an experimental control would be you'd have two um, two different uh, sets of things you were, you were you're studying. You tweak one, you do something to one, and you don't do something to the other one to show that, you know, whatever you've, whatever you've tweaked, that's the cause of whatever difference you see. So it's kind of difficult to do a, a control in something like this, though, because basically they're looking for something that already exists. So they're looking, they looked at patients who didn't have um, any gastric disease, and yet they still found the bacteria in there. And I think that was the problem they were talking about. I mean, they did do controls as much as they could because they're not real, the experiment they're doing is just looking to see what's inside people's stomachs, right? I mean, and so you take it, you take, you look at the contents of sick people, you look at the contents of well people, that's about as good as a control you're gonna get under those, other, other those situations. But the fact that they found the bacteria in healthy people was probably one of the reasons why their, um, their discovery didn't get as much uh, attention early on as it did. So just, I want you to, to, to think about that. H. pylori caused gastritis and peptic ulcer disease. The usual way to prove a bacterium causes a particular disease is to use an animal model. In other words, find an animal that is also susceptible to the disease. And early on, animal models for H. pylori were hard to find. Frustrated and not being taken seriously, and hindered by this lack of an animal model, Barry Marshall came up with a dramatic way to prove this point. He drank a culture of H. pylori. Marshall became ill with nausea and vomiting within a week. Endoscopy confirmed the presence of gastritis and H. pylori, and more importantly, the symptoms disappeared after antibiotic treatment. Marshall now had some evidence linking H. pylori infection of a normal stomach to gastric inflammation. Still, this did little to convince the skeptics. In science, a large sample size is important to achieve statistically significant results. This experiment with just one subject was clearly not good science. However, it certainly captured the attention of the media and the word of the guinea pig doctor who discovered a new cure for ulcers started to spread. Marshall and Warren's finding gained significant support among members of the microbiology community who were immune to the no acid, no ulcer dogma of the medical profession. Several microbiologists, including Martin Skira and myself, became intrigued by H. pylori and set out to understand it better. Well after Marshall volunteered himself as a test subject, I and a colleague at MIT, Jim Fox, successfully developed a mouse model of infection using what we call the Sydney strain of H. pylori. This and other animal models provided a starting point for further studies on H. pylori and its role in peptic ulcer disease. In the early 1990s, evidence built up in support of Marshall and Warren's hypothesis. Clinical trials showed that antibiotics not only cured the symptoms of ulcers, but also prevented their recurrence. 
In contrast, acid reduces medication, alleviate adults' symptoms, but not their recurrence. In 1994, 15 years after Warren's initial observation, a panel from the US National Institutes of Health finally published a statement stating that the key to the treatment of peptic ulcers was detection and eradication of H. pylori. It had taken more than a decade of exhaustive research by Warren, Marshall and many others for the bacterial theory of ulcers to gain official acceptance. The impact of Marshall and Warren's work was profound. Peptic ulcer disease is no longer a chronic, debilitating medical condition. We now know that many ulcers are caused by bacteria and can be cured permanently with antibiotics at a fraction of the cost of earlier treatment methods. Can you identify steps of the scientific method that Marshall and Warren used in their discovery? So I think since we're sort of running out of time, I want you to think um, about that, all the different steps that we talked about and which ones were used in Marshall and Warren in, in, in their work. So I'm gonna let it go to the end, we can, we can uh, discuss it a little bit and then I'll let, it, let everyone go for the day. You might have noted Warren's initial observation of H. pylori in gastric biopsy samples, or his questioning of H. pylori's role in gastritis. Marshall and Warren hypothesized a bacterial cause of gastric disease, and subsequent experiments demonstrate the effectiveness of antibiotics in the treatment of peptic ulcers. Finally, they disseminated their findings amongst the medical and research community. The Helicobacter story illustrates how good science is at the heart of every important scientific discovery. However, science is only one part of the story, and as we've seen, even good data can be met with rejection. So what personal characteristics allowed Marshall and Warren to ultimately succeed despite overwhelming skepticism and negativity? There are a few characteristics that I believe were crucial to Marshall and Warren's success. Curiosity. Fundamental to the process of discovery is the insight of the individual investigator. This story is a result of Robin Warren's keen observation of a few spiral bacteria and his desire to determine their origins. Luck. From Warren and Marshall's initial meeting to the long Easter weekend away from the lab, there is no question that serendipity played a significant role in their scientific journey. Tenacity. Warren and Marshall's persistence was exemplified by their dogged determination to tell others about H. pylori, even in the face of constant criticism, with Marshall even volunteering himself as a guinea pig. By turning to microbiologists and other scientists to address the questions surrounding H. pylori, they eventually gained acceptance in the medical community. In this video, you've heard the fascinating story of Rob Warren and Barry Marshall and how it took them more than a decade of experimentation and the right mix of curiosity, luck and persistence to overturn the deeply entrenched no acid, no ulcer dogma of the medical establishment. As their guest at the 2005 Nobel Prize Award ceremony in Stockholm, Sweden, I had the privilege of seeing our two heroes receive the ultimate reward in scientific research, the 2005 Nobel Prize in Medicine for their groundbreaking work on H. pylori. So often science is taught as irrefutable truth, but this story reminds us that scientific truth can and does change in the face of new evidence. Moving forward, I hope that you will bear in mind the various elements responsible for marginal run success and apply them to your own learning. Okay, I'm just going to share some of the, the questions we were going to do. Uh, oh, right. Get out of there. Yeah. 
Oh, here we go. So, yeah, so these are the, these are the um, questions uh, we want to have you guys ask and they're, and they're answer. And there's a, a assignment in, in Canvas. Basically, you just write down uh, your answers, some, some thoughts, and put them like either in a Word document or a PDF and then submit them. So, um, what are some of the ethical concerns about Marshall's use to like actually drink a sample of H. pylori? Like, that's pretty dramatic, and I probably wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, you know, I mean, what are what are some of the worries you would have about that? I mean, I I can certainly think about some some worries I would have. Is that a cure, maybe? Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, I definitely wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't recommend it. Um, and then next, there's basically four criteria. One of the things that uh, we uh, talked about was the, was the control. And when they initially did their um, experiments, they just had uh, human subjects and they found that there was a correlation between the presence of this bacteria and, and gastric disease but they needed to actually prove it. And so these are the, basically the four criteria of the proof, is that you find the, the bacteria in diseased animals, but they don't, they're not present in healthy ones. So that's the first one. You have to isolate whatever it is, the pathogen, the virus, or the bacteria from the disease animal and then grow it outside of its body. Then you must take that uh, cultured pathogen and put it back into an experimental animal and see if you get the same disease. So basically that's, you have to isolate it first, grow it outside, put it into another animal, take that, the bacteria or whatever, or virus from that second animal, culture it again and prove that it's the same one. And so see, um, from from the video, did they do that? And a question for that, just a curiosity. I just got curious. When you insert that virus to another animal, uh, mm -hmm. does the other animal that is gonna get that test is it healthy, or do they yes. have they checked that he has nothing wrong? Or oh yeah, yeah, you have to you have to show that there's absolutely no trace of that pathogen in, in, in your test animal. Oh, any other, okay. Yeah, and you basically, I mean, you, uh, or sometimes you um, want to have very specific animals with a very specific genetic background because you want to prove that like, let's say a particular gene is involved in a particular uh, disease. So you can order uh, basically a mouse that has a knockout of one particular gene. So in that situation, you take your, your, your virus, you put it into a healthy, um, a healthy strain of mouse, it would get diseased. You take that same uh, virus, you put it into a, into a mouse that has that gene knocked out. And if that uh, mouse, second mouse does not get the disease, then you've shown that there's a link between that gene and, and the virus. In this particular interest, um, all they were wanted to know is whether that bacteria caused uh, the disease in a healthy mouse. So all you needed to, to, to show was that um, the bacteria was absent in the, in the healthy mouse and then it was present in the, in the sick one. Mm. Yeah, great, great question. And then finally, the last one, do you really think they should have got a Nobel Prize for that? That's up for your own opinion. I can't say whether you think they should or, or, they, sh or they shouldn't. Um, but one of the things that, that uh, is mentioned in the video is that, you know, it took 10 whole years for them. That's nothing. I mean, it takes a lot longer for, for, for other people. I mean, there's some, some people have gone like 30 years or even 40 years before they uh, received the uh, you know, prizes and, and, and glory and whatever that they should have a long time ago. So 10 years really isn't that long. 
So if you're thinking you're going to like start working in the lab and get a Nobel Prize in 10 years, I got some bad news for you. It generally takes a lot longer than that. So, so the third question is, do you, how significant do you think that discovery is? Um, and basically what lessons can be learned from that story? If you were thinking of becoming a, a researcher, what, what did you learn from, from their story that you would want to put in, into your own work? So does anybody have any questions on like um, how, to, how to do this particular assignment? Question, where is it on Canvas? It should be under assignments. Um, Here, let me, since I'm sharing with you, uh, assignments. Student view. And it should be right there. Recitation number one, scientific method, JF LeBlanc. Um, so are you going to put the PDF up for us or were we supposed to take a picture of that? No, you just submit it as a PDF. Because I don't see any PDF on there. No, there isn't. You, you create one and then, the and, questions then, and, then and then submit it. Oh, the, oh, whether the questions are there. Yeah. Oh, the questions are actually on are right here. Oh, so we were supposed to take a picture. Oh, I see what you mean. Um, I can uh, post this along with the along with the assignment. How about that? Okay. Yeah, that make that's a good, that's a great suggestion. And this uh, this class is being recorded, right? So we can just go yes. to this and look at it too. Yeah. Uh, where would this be posted? Like the um, I think I'm recording it to my computer, so I'll just I will rather than the cloud. So I think I will have to post it as a, as a file. Okay. I think I may just have to post it on my YouTube page, but I'll, I'll put a link to that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Will the video itself be uh, posted as well? Yep. Perfect, thank you. I think, I think oh, oh, you mean the video we just watched? Yes. Yeah, I think there's, yeah, that there'll be a link to the slides the instructions, and then the video of the class as well. Perfect, thank you. Okay, no problem. Anybody else have any questions? I'm still waitlisted. I don't have access to the class at all. So like, mm. what did I do? What, what number are you? Mine says 14, I think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, generally, like at least I know the first five generally get added and then sometimes up to 10, but yeah, 14 is a little, yeah, it might, it might not work out. Have you tried the, um, the other d uh, schools in the district? No, I haven't. Yeah. You, because of the, yeah, this one's pretty full up. So you might, you might try uh, uh, Kenyatta or yeah, the other, the other one. Let's see. I just had a, my brain went blank for a minute. Let's see the other college, Kenyatta and San Mateo. Right, San Mateo, the CSN. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. No, I have okay. a question for the yes. assignments. Mm -hmm. Mine says scientific method Schubert. Am I in the wrong class or? Um. Where does it say that? And when I click the assignments and it says upcoming assignments, it tells me scientific method uh, Schubert. They should Not both be one. there. They're, mine, mine isn't there. No. Hmm. Mine's the same way, actually. Huh. Okay. I'll. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, maybe you were supposed to show off yesterday. I don't know. I mean, it's. I think there should be about thirty-two people in each group. And I think there was like about 40 people here today. So there, there might be some people who are in the wrong section. But so I that was actually specifically sent to this one. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Um, Cause they told me I'll, I'll find, I'll, I'll find out with, um, I'll ask Dr. Schubert, like what the, what the, what the breakdown is, make, make sure everyone gets the, 
get sent the right links. So, so should we do Schubert's assignment since it's due today or? It's the, no, um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, if that's the one you have, then yeah, I've just sent it there. I think you have it until midnight. And it'll be the same assignment as yours? Yes, it's exactly the same. Okay. Yeah. Because hers says, um, submit your notes. Oh, is that a different, that might be a different assignment. Yeah, it says it's due today. Yeah, just yeah, just the answers. I mean, that's yeah. So that's, she Isn't means it? the same thing. Right. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll find out from her what we what the breakdown is between the two different groups. Professor. Yep. Um. Um, I still don't see your assignment under my assignments page in Canvas. So, so you just see, um, you just uh, see, you just see Schubert Scientific Method dash Schubert. Yes, and Student Survey Week One Introduction and Practice Assignment. I don't see yours. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, it was sent there. So I'll, I'll, I'll double check and make sure that it was sent to the right, to the right section. Okay, so for now, should I just do Schubert's? You might as well. Yeah, until, until we straighten it out. Okay. Is there anybody who gets my, <laughs> who has my assignment there? I have it. Okay. Are you the only one? <laughs> Too. Okay, good. Pretty sure I have it too. It says a uh, LeBlanc. There you go. Weird. Okay. I'll yeah, I'll I'll find out what the what the difference is. It 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 may be that yeah, we just have we just need to shake out the the two sections a little bit. These things okay. sort of generally happen in the first week or two. On the other hand, it's only worth like two points, so I wouldn't get all that excited about it. <laughs> Other than like, other than, like the fourteen hundred you'll get by the end of the class. Okay, thank you. All right, no problem. Any other questions? Um, when you post the PDF of the questions, can you also put a link of the video on there too? Yeah, it might take a while because I have to. Um, I think it's being saved to my computer, so I'll probably put it up into. Um, Put it up into uh, YouTube uh, tomorrow morning. Okay. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Good luck getting your um, getting your lab kits next week. And even if you don't get them by by Tuesday, basically we're just going to be going over like how not to set yourself on fire uh, when, when you do get them and, and and stuff like that on Tuesday. So we won't be actually doing an experiment till the week after that. Then we'll start having some fun. Um, but, but we will be meeting on Tuesday at 1.10, right? Yes. I, I believe that's the time. Okay, good. I have another question for the yep. sampling code. Um, is it okay if I get mine uh, next week? Because they're, they were telling me that they're in back order. Oh, you can get it directly from uh, Macmillan if you can't get it from the bookstore. So should I get a refund from the bookstore and then get the Zabin code? Oh, I see. You've already, already paid them it. for it. Yeah. Oh, if you can. I mean, I had. I think I had someone with this problem yesterday. Yeah, they just got a ref. They they didn't get their money back. They just got the, you know a, a store credit. Like great. You know how many mm -hmm. sweatshirts do I need? I can, <laughs> and I can't even come on campus to get it. <laughs> So yeah, it's sort of up to you. If you if you if you if you if you, you want to wait, I think that's probably okay. Um, we don't have so, any assignments yet, right? Well, I think there was like a yeah practice. I think the only assignment was, was to get familiar with it. So it, yes, yeah, it's, it's not that much of a, of a problem. If it takes more than a week, I think that I would just get it from McMillan directly and suck up the store credit. Sounds good. Yeah, uh, professor, do we yep. need a digital book? 
uh, access code? No, the book is free. It should be a, it should be a, a link to download it directly. You okay. can either read it online, which I wouldn't recommend, or just or you can just download the PDF directly to your computer, and then you just have it with you at all times. Okay. Yeah. If you, if you can't find it, send send me a message. I'll I'll get one to you. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty big. It's like, uh, man, I can't remember how many megabytes it is. It's pretty big. Mm -hmm. It's like fifteen hundred pages or something. Whoa. Big document. All right, any, anything else before we go? One more question. Oh, sure. That's what we're here for. So for the, on Canvas, um, when I go to the homepage and click like week one, welcome week. Mm -hmm. um, so like in the future for future references, um, for textbook reading chapters and like the textbook practice questions or like things like that, do we... Um, do we have to do it and turn it in? Oh, um, I don't think, unless it's an assignment, like, if, like an assignment where you physically s send in something, then no. So usually the assignments that we do and have to turn in are usually just the discussions and the other assignments are all labeled in at-home assignments, right? Yep, 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 yep. And those are the ones that we only turn in. Um, Generally, yeah. I mean, if it's if it's if it's not the sapling homework or assignments for like the right under the 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 assignment tab, then yeah, they they don't have to be they don't have to be turned in. Okay. Yep. If you want to make extra work for yourself, feel free, but I don't, I don't think so. Okay. All right. Yeah. And I don't know if you can answer the question on Google docs. I mean, you, I guess you could write on Google docs and then download it as a, whatever, as a word file or a PDF and then submit that. But I don't think you can, you can't submit a Google Docs link because we can't open those from inside of Canvas. Yeah, students, students have tried that for a long time, send, sending me some weird Google Docs link and then you can't open them from inside Canvas, it's a pain. You can only open like Word documents, PDFs, uh, like uh, text or um, like Excel spreadsheets, that's, that's sort of thing. It's pretty limited as to what you, as to what you can submit. But like, you know, pay, like uh, Apple pages, like um, we can, can't, can't open those. So, so they have to be either, either I would suggest either Word or PDF. Okay. All right, everyone, I will see you on Tuesday. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. So anytime, any, uh, any other questions, send me, send me an email. I'm generally pretty good at getting back to them. Um, pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. All right, bye everybody. Thank you. Good, good meeting everyone.